I'm Dave Glazer. I'm a personal trainer, TikTok creator, and founder of Dave Glazer Coaching. After a couple of breakups in 2017, I became obsessed with understanding relationships, the way people connect. And along this journey, I have created a life and podcast dedicated to lifelong learning and exploring how we communicate with each other through modern dating, text messaging, social media, and dating apps. This podcast brings the industry's top experts in relationship, best-selling authors, speakers, and real-life daters. We discuss the struggles, the celebrations, the fears we face, and all the wonder that relationships can bring into our lives. Please subscribe to the podcast and connect with me on Instagram and TikTok to take a candid look into modern dating. Hey, good morning, everybody. Happy hump day. It's Wednesday. I am going live today to be joined by a special guest. Uh, my friend, uh, Brittany in Boise, Idaho is going to jump on. And as you join us, please put your name and where you're from in the comment section below and, uh, hit me up with those dating questions. Cause I've got my special guest, Brittany. Welcome. Hi. Welcome. Welcome. Hey, how are you? I'm doing well. How about yourself? I'm hanging in there. It's a, it's a Wednesday. So yeah, halfway through. Yeah. I think, I think we got your, your snowstorm because <clears throat> it is uh, next to a blizzard here today. Yeah. Uh, what was it? Two Monday night. It was coming down sideways. So, but it's all melted now. So enjoy yeah. it. Yeah. And remind me you're in Boise, right? Yep. I'm in Boise. So. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining me. We're going to be answering some dating questions today, but before we do, I wanted to I wanted to hear a little bit more about your Facebook group story. Tell me tell me a little bit of backstory and then I've heard of these Facebook groups popping up all over the country of like are we dating the same guy? So, give me a little rundown yes. on on what that's all about. So, I actually have an additional story since I sent you that one. Um, oh, wow. So okay. I'm so I'm a part of two different groups. Um, one is on the East Coast and then one is here um, in Boise. And it's, are we dating the same guy? And it's a, a Facebook group where you post um, like dating profiles of men that you're either dating or entertaining. Um, and so on Super Bowl, I decided to get on and see if um, anybody was asking about my ex-fiance who... Um, had cheated on me and all this stuff. So I logged on there and I looked up his name and the third person down was this guy that I've been dating off and on since August. Mm. And um, I had, you know, commented and a bunch of women reached out to me and like wanted to know timelines. So we got into a group chat and started comparing timelines and I ended up overlapping several times with these oh, women. No. Um, he actually left a girl on her birthday trip um, that he paid for to come see me. And it was, it's just been a disaster. Um, more mm. and more women are like appearing. Um, and then last night I was on the Boise one and found a guy that I had been talking to, like very new. And um, he, he has been dating somebody seriously since November. And oh, wow. I called him yeah. out and I was like, dude, like he sent me a happy, happy Valentine's Day text and I didn't respond. And then when mm. all of this unfolded, I called him out. I was like, oh, did you wish this to Elizabeth? And I think her name was Paige. I was like, did you wish them <laughs> happy Valentine's Day too? And he was like, I deserved that. And I was like, wow, buddy. Wow. Buddy. So, yeah, I so, feel friends. Uh, that's that's amazing that has brought yeah. the that has brought the group of you together. So where was this birthday trip that he traveled home from? Mexico. So he left this poor girl in Mexico by herself and came and met me. Yeah. Wow, that's that's bold. Like yeah. I don't know if I've ever heard anything quite like that. It's it's been a, a wild ride. As soon as I saw him, I messaged my girlfriends, like the the screen recording, and then I called them and I was like, "Check your phone." And so we were all on a group call and like yeah. basically screaming, like, "Oh my god, is this real life?" Wow. So, yeah. Yeah, I I feel for you. I had a similar story show up in my life. Of uh, I've hosted a podcast for like four and a half years, almost five now. <clears throat> 
And two of my guests within about three or four weeks uh, after we recorded our episode, we were just chit chatting and they're telling me about this guy that they're dating. And when the second one shared the story, I'm like, oh my gosh, what is his name? Where does he live? And show me a picture on Instagram. And it turns out that two of my podcasts who were from completely different walks of life were dating the same guy. And one of them was dating him for seven months. And the other one had just met him a month ago. And uh, I connected the two of them and they became very fast, very best friends. One of them is now married with a baby to a different person. And the other one got into a beautiful relationship for a couple of years as a result of just connecting people who are describing the same person out of like, I, I see it as like a protector showing up, you know, mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's not my business, but in that moment, I was like, this is way too real. You two are both way too sweet to be victimized by this person. And they are both moving on and living beautiful lives. Yeah. I, it's, it's just like appalling to me. Like, sorry, I'm adjusting the camera. Um, like how bold people are. It's not just men, it's women. It's, it's a generational thing at this point. Um, and we just really need to stand by each other because people are predators at this right. point. Like they are preying on, and I was in a very vulnerable place when I met him and he knew that. And um, based on the stories from the other women, he was preying on women in vulnerable situations. Mm. Who, um, I was just starting to date again after my engagement ended and he was the first person that I had feelings for. And then this all unfolded and I'm, I dodged a bullet. So mm, thanks sounds like it thing network, but yeah. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm hearing you describe this supportive Facebook group where you can go as a, like a resource uh, mm -hmm. to just check in and say, okay, here's his dating profile. This is our story. Is anybody else dating the same person? Yep. And what comes up for me is while dating multiple people at the same time is not unethical in any way, as long as you're communicating about that. Yep. Would you Absolutely. would you agree? Do you have anything to Absolutely. add to that? I have friends who are poly, who are in ethically non-monogamous relationships, and I've had conversations with them um, about like how it works, the logistics. And they said the number one key is communication with their main partner. And then also being communicative with the, the new person and making sure that they all are on the same page. So right. I think that it's doable. Yeah, that's what I've heard as well. And as I'm single and I'm dating, um, dating on a dating app is almost like you can make the assumption that people are dating other people. Yep. And commu communicating about – this is something I've learned that's so critical is communicating about what I want is way more important about asking where they're at because that is either going to attract what I'm looking for or weed out those people who are not looking for what I'm looking for at the same time. Exactly. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I am huge on communication. And even if it's just like, hey, this is my communication style, like, don't be alarmed if I disappear for a few days, like, let me know that. <laughs> so then I'm not in my head because I haven't dated in a really long time. And so I get into my head and have that imposter syndrome. So mm. yeah, what do you mean by imposter syndrome? Tell me more about that. So I when I was living in DC, I was engaged to somebody in politics. And I come from a very humble beginning. Um, my dad was a truck driver, my mom owned a daycare. And um, I came into this world of politics. And I just felt like I didn't belong. Um, and my partner didn't do anything to reassure me. And so mm. I developed this like, I'm not good enough, like persona mm. and always doubting who I am as a person. And it's taken the last year to like really become comfortable in my own skin again and like healing and going to therapy and seeing a psychiatrist and really fostering the relationships that I already had and fostering the relationship with myself and mm -hmm. me. Um, so when I'm dating, I'm quick to fall back into that imposter syndrome of, oh my God, they're not talking to me because I'm not good enough or yeah. anything along those lines. Right, right. Are you familiar with attachment styles? I am. I am a disorganized attachment. Um, so I fall under a little bit of the anxious and a little bit of the avoidant um, where I tend to 
like shut down when things get a little bit like too intense or Mm -hmm. um yeah it's Mm -hmm. I communication is huge and I definitely fall under like the oh my gosh they're not talking to me so I'm gonna attach harder or right right I can so relate I'm also fearful avoidant that's one of the disorganized attachment styles and so when when I'm in relationship with an avoidant that's when the anxious attachment style shows up for me and vice versa um, for the longest time, I experienced life as an avoidant attachment um, style in all relationships up until the time that I really cut back on drinking because I found that alcohol was numbing yeah. my anxiety in general. Like uh, you mentioned, you were seeing a therapist and a psychiatrist, and I, I'm a huge proponent of therapy. And uh, my my latest therapist Uh, went through a scenario and he's like, Dave, generalized anxiety disorder is what you're facing right now. And I'm like, wow, for years I was covering that up with um, consistent moderate alcohol use. Mm -hmm. And now I have all these other emotions show up for me when I'm out there dating in the modern world, because I'm like, what the fuck is this anxiety thing? (laughs) I have never experienced that before. It's yeah, it's crazy I never have dealt with like anxiety until I can well I have but not to this magnitude um and then like add in I'm bipolar on top of it on top of my meds like very functioning have a great career which is uncommon with people who are bipolar Mm -hmm. um or you have to work extra hard at it and it's just like added. It's just another layer to like anxiety and mental health. Mm-hmm. And then you throw yeah. in dating and you're like, what is going on? Like, what the fuck? Right. <laughs> it's, it sounds like you've overcome a lot in your life. And how would you say that that actually contributes to you having more self-worth now? Because some of the things I've heard you say is, is very uh, coming from a place of having self-worth. How, how have you overcome all of that? It's been a lot of um, reflection and like thinking about what can I bring to the table in a relationship? Um, What do I find positive about myself instead of focusing on the negative? Like, oh, you know, I don't bring anything to the table. Like I've got three kids. I have all this baggage. Um, And it's really been about what can I bring to the table, what is good about me instead of just focusing on that negative. And then also like what fills my cup is um, talking to other people and helping them. So doing things like this, like it fills my cup, which then in turn, like just makes me a happier individual. So, Mm. yeah. Yeah, thanks for joining me once again. Like we, we've never really talked much before uh, today, but um, appreciate all that you share on TikTok and Instagram. And if you guys aren't following Brittany, please do so. And um, what I was going to ask is you've mentioned a couple of times building a relationship with yourself. And that mm-hmm. is one of the most important things that you're focused on right now. Tell me, tell me more about what that looks like and that, that feels like for you. Yeah. So I think it's so common in a relationship to lose yourself. You become so focused on making your partner happy and making your relationship work. Even if it's not meant to work, you're just clinging to it a lot of the times that you lose yourself. And for me, it was, I forgot what I enjoyed in life. Um, I forgot, you know, what made me happy. And so I've spent the last year kind of discovering if things that made me happy prior to my relationships, if they still made me happy or if there's additional things. And I rediscovered my love of hiking and the outdoors. And so I spend a lot of time um, outdoors. I have a Jeep and it's fully stocked um, with like, in case I get stuck in the wilderness, which I have twice, um, <laughs> like on a snowy Story time. road. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it's like really been you know, working on myself, going to therapy, learning how to cope with um, when I get anxiety or my ADHD kicks into full gear and I'm just like all over the place. It's what can I do for myself um, instead of like a self self soothing versus like reaching out to everybody for everybody else to fill my cup. 
Right, right. And that, it sounds like there's a big difference between self-soothing and relying on other people to reassure, reassure you that you're good enough. Yeah. So what have you found that that's, that has impacted you most or empowered you most? Tell me more. So I think um, writing and like looking, I don't know, it's, it's hard to explain. Like I no longer go and seek attention for other, from other people. Like, am I doing good enough? Like I sit there and I look at, again, what have I done that's good in my life? And it's definitely helped a lot um, before I would reach out to people and just need that reassurance. And now I'm learning that I don't need that re reassurance mm. because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what they think of me. It's what I think of myself. Mm. Can I look myself in the mirror? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. We got a question here that I want your I want your help answering maybe from your personal experience. So is it normal for avoidance to want to break up with you whenever they're going through something? Have you ever had any experience with that? I so I don't know my ex's like, attachment style, per se, but he like would not communicate. And when things got really hard, he would just like shut down. And I think that made him push me away um, versus actually communicating with me. It was easier for him to walk away in the relationship than it was for him to work through the hard stuff. Mm. Yeah, that does sound familiar to my own behavior and then behavior from people when I when I assume that they have avoidant attachment styles. And, and you're spot on that like when things get hard, I think that their defense mechanism or their deactivation strategy is what it's called is to shut down and pull away because it's almost as if like there's a sense of fullness where they don't know how to process that full capacity of their emotions. Mm -hmm. And so in order to deal with like work trouble or family trouble, the first thing to go for an avoidant attachment style is their relationship. Absolutely. And he, ha he was going through a lot with work and I think that that is really like, he couldn't, he couldn't juggle it all. Um, mm -hmm. And I was, the most recent thing to come. And so I was the easiest one to cut off completely. Mm. So. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. That, that must have sounded really dismissive and um, di as if you were disposable. So I, I can't even imagine how hard that was. I got a 30 second phone call. Oh, brutal. And then <laughs> blocked everywhere and um, shipped me like eight of my boxes from DC to Idaho. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's cold. And, and I definitely recall all of my years spent as somebody who was uh, leaning more towards avoidant attachment style of really not wanting to take a look at my responsibility and my own behavior in my relationships that I created. I always took the victim role and the victim mindset as the avoidant. And I know that the anxious can do the same thing. It's just coming from a different place of like, oh, they're always around or they're too much or they want too much of my time or um, they're communicating too much. So we're talking about communication a lot today from the avoidant and the anxious attachment style lens. And what does it feel like in a relationship to have an appropriate amount of, of communication from your perspective? And then what are you looking for from a partner? So I... As far as communication goes, I want to know how they handle um, when things get like hard or an issue arises. Do you need to step away? Do you need to process it or do you want to talk about it immediately? Then that way I can adjust and maybe we can come to a compromise to where we're both like feeling content and good about the situation. Mm. Um, if I'm pushing on you to talk and you're pulling away, like it just makes it that much harder and we both become resentful to one another. So I think it's important when you're going into a relationship and like really going, okay, is this going to work? Like, how are you communicating? Um, are you wanting to like write it out or are you wanting to like verbally discuss it? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that's important. Um, right. 
Yeah. Thank you very much for expanding on that. Do you feel as if uh, people you've been in a relationship know the answer to those questions or does it take them a long time to process and figure that out? Like case by case, instance by instance, it's almost as if like, um, I would have to relearn what I needed in those moments because I wasn't really clear on my needs, desires, and wants in a relationship as an avoidant. Yeah, it's um, – and I think our communication style also adjusts from person to person. Just like our love languages can adjust from person to person, it's, it's the same thing. Your communication style may be one way in a relationship and another way at work. Um, but I think it's, um, like, I've gone into relationships where men don't know, like, how to communicate or don't know what they want, and then they get frustrated. Like, I, it's like a push and pull almost, and I'm sitting here going, um, I'm just very communicative, and I don't <laughs> shut down, um, because I've been in relationships where that was how it went, and it made me feel terrible, so I try to, like, not push my communication style on them, but at least show them what I need. Mm. Yeah, it sounds like you're talking about modeling what you need in a relationship. Like, I'll I'll take the lead and I will show somebody the type of communication that I need in a relationship. Like, I will almost always text back within 24 hours. And in the early stages of dating, what are your thoughts on just strictly logistical planning through text or do you like more contact than that for, during the talking stage or during the first few dates? We touched on this yesterday on your live. Did we, did we yes. talk about that? Yeah. So you were talking about how you uh, like, you couldn't meet up with a girl for three weeks. And then, so you guys did like a quick FaceTime. Um, I tend to date long distance. And so I think it's important to have at least some communication, especially when you don't have that face-to-face -face inter interaction on a, even a semi-regular basis. Um, so like, you know, a meme here or there or anything along those lines that keeps it kind of like lighthearted, but like the conversation just like flowing. Mm -hmm. Um I don't like to go like longer than I would say 72 hours, maybe like a little bit longer. Um, but again, it's that communication of, Hey, I drop off the face of the earth during the week, but you know, let's do a quick FaceTime on the weekend or something right. along those lines. So. Right. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense to me. So what is it about long distance relationships that feels like the right fit for you or that just sounds like it gravitates to you? I travel about six months out of the year for work. Um, I spend a lot of time in DC. So primarily that is where I have dated. Um, I like to have my own life and that probably sounds very selfish. I'm okay with that though. Um, <laughs> I like in Boise when I'm here, I'm focused on my kids and my, my friends. And so when I'm, able to focus on my partner. I want to fully focus on them. Um, and so dating long distance when I'm there, I'm fully in on the relationship. And when I'm home, I can have my own life, which is right. again selfish, but. Right. How do you flip flop between the two? Like, um, how do you stay, I don't know the right word grounded. How do you stay centered as you travel so much and you kind of switch between Mom, fully mm -hmm. focused there, and partner, fully focused there. How do you do that? I also have um, a corporate job, so I have to, <laughs> to balance all three. My job is very demanding. Um, I, I think the biggest way that I stay grounded is I just, like, make sure, one, that I'm following – like, my morals throughout it, um, and I'm the same person consistently – I'm the same person with my friends here in Boise as I am in DC with my friends. And I think just really being true to myself. And if I'm with like my partner and my kids call, like they have to understand that my kids like are number one. Um, and I think just keeping them as my priority, no matter where I'm at, like really helps keep like me grounded. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds really, that sounds really authentic when you're the same person between friend groups and between locations 
And then also you're still on mom duty when you travel and be with your partner, if that's the case at the time. So um, this corporate job, does it, does it keep you in like the masculine energy? Do you feel like structured at work? And then do you have a hard time switching out of that when you're off, I, the, off the clock? Um, I am a type A through and through. So I like, I have schedules. I live by my calendar. Um, when I go on a trip, I like start packing a week or two prior. Um, I like, so I need structure in all parts of my life. I'm very much a plan person. I don't go with the flow. Um, I know that about myself. I've tried very hard to work on that throughout like the last year though. Mm, mm -hmm. And what, what have you discovered after the last year? How does that structure help you, uh, help you um, stay it grounded? Keeps, it keeps my mental health like in line. And that is like, I can't be a mom. I can't work. I can't be a good partner if my mental health is not taken care of. And so structure is what I need. I, I absolutely can be spontaneous, but it, when it comes to my job or like my kids, I'm not very go with the flow because uh -huh. I run yeah. such a tight schedule all the time. Mm -hmm. Got that shit on lockdown. <laughs> I, do. I do. My kids hate it, but it's fine. Right. Well, thanks again for joining me. And if there's like a message that you want to leave people with, and by the way, if you're not following Brit, please do so. Click, uh, click over to her page and click that follow button. Uh, what do you want to leave us with? What message would you like us to take away? I think that when you're going into dating, you just can't lose yourself in it. Like you can't allow it to consume you. Um, at the end of the day, most of the conversations you're having are going to fizzle out. And so throughout the entire process, you just need to make sure that you're staying true to yourself um, versus every conversation you're like, oh, this is it. This is the one. Um, <laughs> Cause it's, it's like, it's not like, no. <laughs> it may be, no. but it's, <laughs> you, you, know, you need it. You need at least a year to figure out who somebody truly is. Absolutely. People go by that three month marker. I don't think it's three months. I think it's a year um, mm. before you get to know a person's ins and outs. And I think it's important to spend time with them like overnight, a vacation. Like even if it's not far away, you need to, go somewhere so then you can see if you can travel with that person. yeah there's there's no bigger test in a relationship than parenting travel or or money you know yeah. all of those conversations so um what did you mean by like most conversations fizzle out where does that story come from i well it's on me if we're being completely honest um and i know that i tend to get bored on the apps um people don't hold my attention and or they just are way too aggressive and so i tend to pull back i want somebody who takes initiative but not somebody who like full force goes into it um so i tend to let conversations fizzle out or i forget to get on the apps like i'm mm. terrible at them i'll go like weeks and then i sure. log on and i'm like oh all these people tried to talk to me Oh, God. So. <laughs> yeah, that's generally been my experience as well. So was I talking on yesterday's live about that first message invitation to dinner yes. being very assertive and direct? So <laughs> the gal from 16 years ago, right? Yeah, we used, we used to work together. And um, oh, this is not the first time we've matched on the app either. Like the last time was maybe three or four years ago. And uh, don't know what's happened in her life since. But I'm like, you know what? Fuck it. We're not perfect strangers. Let me just ask you. Out <laughs> I think that's okay. I've had people though be super aggressive, like one or two messages, and then they are full fledged. Give me your number. When are we going out? Like, I don't like, they don't know anything about me. And I'm like, I right. could be a serial killer. And they're like, come to my house. I'm like, no, I'm not coming to your house. Are you crazy? So. Yeah, what's the likelihood that we're both serial killers? Yeah, I mean, right? <laughs> I, yeah. so I, I definitely, um, I go into it a little bit more cautious. So, sure, I think that's a, I think that's a fair approach to online dating. Um, you are essentially meeting a perfect stranger, 
And uh, most recently, I am taking the approach of being a little bit more assertive and direct and clear when it comes to dating apps, because I don't want a talking stage. I really don't. Yeah. I, I would like to meet, connect, talk for a day or two, whether that's four messages or 10 messages. I'm going to generally ask you out to coffee or, or whatever um, within a week. I'm not going to, I'm not even going to let the connection uh, go longer than that because uh, really, honestly, on it, on the apps, we're just, we're just making sure that the other person is interested enough to meet up in person. Yep. That's Absolutely. it. And there was something about your profile that made me want to connect. So there's at least a little bit there, Yeah. you know, and most recently uh, I matched with somebody and she led the conversation. She's like, Oh, are you a jujitsu guy? And from there, the conversation flowed. And within a couple of days, I asked for coffee. I, I think that as long as it's like an organic conversation and it's not, what's your favorite color? What's your favorite movie? Like, I only, I can't do it anymore. I literally, I have no more what's your favorite colors left in me. Not I just, I just threw up in my mouth because the small talk is so draining for me. I, I usually lead with, um, what's your biggest fear? I just mm. like full force go into it. And, um, <laughs> I'd rather meet for coffee than ask for the answer that question. <laughs> like I just dive right in. Like, what is your biggest fear or like, what is your own biggest red flag for yourself? Um, and if you can't self-reflect and know your own biggest red flag, that in itself is a red flag, like huge. Yeah, I, I went on a date with somebody who actually said that we were, we were walking. I was walking her back to her car and I'm like, um, she asked me what my biggest red flag was. And I'm like, oh, I've got so many. Do you, where do I start? You know? <laughs> and then I, I shared one of them and I asked a qu the same question back and she's like, um, I don't really have any. Is that my red flag? I'm like, yeah, it is. But I'm still willing to go out with you again. Cause we got to that point of just joking about red flags and you're spot on. Like if somebody can't recognize my toxic trait is that I tend to have relationship problems. I'm not with people I'm not in relationship with. Right. Yep. So what would you say your biggest red flag is or toxic trait? Um, I am emotionally unavailable a lot of the time. Um, <laughs> Tell me more I about that. <laughs> or I push people away. I, uh, I am definitely more emotionally unavailable because I have such a guard up like against um, dating and men, I have a hard time trusting. And that definitely <clears throat> comes from childhood trauma. I've unpacked that like with my psychiatrist and my counselor of like, where does it stem from? Why am I so emotionally unavailable and have such a hard time connecting? Cause I can do it with my friends. I, sure. I or with a perfect stranger on TikTok. I mean, exactly. But if it comes to dating, <laughs> Lord help me, I'm not going to allow you in. Like I, yeah. Or I allow people in. This is like probably my biggest red flag. I will, bring people in, allow them to get semi close to me and I can control the narrative. And then if things get too real or they become too attached, I'm like, okay, I'm done. Let's, let's move along. Like I, right. so. Yeah. What do you mean by um, control the narrative? Uh, you let them in and then you control the narrative. Are, are you completely in charge or are you leading it's, the relationship? Is that what I'm hearing? It's more of, I will let you know what you need to know or what, um, you know, applies to the circumstance. Oh, okay. And I like tend to like, you only need to know a certain amount of my life, but if you ask too many questions, I'm going to pull back and not let you okay. in. Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I totally get where you're coming from that. Like not everybody deserves our entire story right away. And so one of my favorite authors, Brene Brown, she says, like, you want to drip the, the, the full story. You want to give it a little bit at a time. So I respect where you're coming from there. And then on the flip side, you've already owned it, that you're emotionally unavailable. And then when somebody asks you a lot of questions, that's when you pull back. So where is the match up the timeline for me and then how vulnerable you can be along the way? 
Sure. So anytime we get into my childhood, I'm like, hard line, we're not going there. Um, Pump the brakes. Yeah. I'm like, I'm not, or it's my kids. Like, you want to talk about my kids? Like, that's a hard line for me in the beginning because I'm trying to protect them. That is my mm. job, mother. I don't mm. bring them into relationships. They, like, I have an almost 16 year old, and my daughter will be 13 on the 24th. And then I have a six year old. Um, my dating life does not like does not apply to them and my partner or whoever I'm entertaining doesn't need to know that part of my life from the get-go I I'm very upfront I have children um that's all you need to know don't ask me about my co-parenting situation like that's not your business so Mm, okay Okay. Yeah, yeah I, I can understand that, that it takes, it takes time to develop trust and a foundation with a potential partner. And I was on a date in um, July, uh, first date, we met over coffee and I was sharing that I have a 20 year old daughter. She was about to be 20 and she has this job. And, and then my date was like, oh, I can't wait to meet her. And I felt like you did. I'm like, uh, there's a big pullback. There's like a big um, alarm system going off in my body because while she's 19, she's an adult, I still protect her, right? Like I do have, I do have healthy boundaries when it comes to my child. Yeah. And <clears throat> the joke or the follow-up joke was like, well, do we get free Chipotle? Because my daughter was working at Chipotle. And I'm like, all right, all right, all right. Let's pump the brakes here just a, just a little bit. And, you know, I didn't reach out after the first date and eventually she did. And I was like, okay, there was enough there. There was like 90% there, but this was the 10% that I was cautious about. And we did give it two more dates and then it, it just kind of stopped after that. Absolutely. It, I mean, it's that fizzle. So it it mm. goes up. So I think this one, that- this one was more of like a blow up and then we're like, okay, we're done. Is this one of those you have relationship problems without being in a relationship? Uh, Yes, and like what came up for me on our third date is um, the morning of our third date, I was cooking dinner and she's like, hey, I'll bring uh, I'll bring wine. What goes well with dinner? I was like, hey, feel free to bring whatever you want. White wine would go great with our chicken tacos tonight. By the way, I'm not a drinker. And she's like, well, that's news to me, although we met on Hinge and it's very clearly stated in my profile, right? I'm like, okay, how much of my profile did you read? And then it comes down to the actual date and we're talking about what a relationship looks like for each of us. And she's like, so do you want kids? Like just like blurts that out. And that's also in my profile on Hinge that I don't want more kids. And I just, I got a little reactive and uh, my fear of abandonment showed up. And honestly, it just kind of like went downhill from there. We had one more conversation after that. And it just wasn't the right fit. I I feel like that kids conversation, it, it should come up early. Mm. Um, I'm very transparent um, when it comes, just like you are, I don't want more kids. It's not physically possible. I had cancer when I was 28, then had a, a hysterectomy. And it's not possible for me. I have three children who are almost like, well, they're all self-sufficient. And my six-year-old is as much as he can be. And, uh, <laughs> and I don't want the baby face again. Like, sure. I don't, I don't feel that need to have anymore, whether it be like adoption or them. I mean, obviously, if they have children, that's one thing. But I try very hard to not date people with young kids. It's mm. it's too hard um, juggling, you know, multiple families. I travel. Um, yeah. And I don't want to become attached to a small child and then and it not work out. And, sure. and that's not fair to my six year old either if he if they're around the same age. So right. So same age and younger or just younger than six. Uh, tell me more about I, what you mean by young kids. Like six and below, um, because my youngest loves little kids and like become Mm. very attached and I can't do that to him. I watched my, like when my ex left, the two of them were best friends and he felt such like this gaping hole of abandonment. I never want to put him through that again. Um, and I know that it can happen with an adult. I just hope that they're, you know, 
a little bit nicer than my ex was when it comes mm. to leaving. So. Yeah, I feel you there. Well, thank you again, Britt, so much for your time. I know that you've got this corporate job and I won't keep you from it, but uh, thanks again for the conversation. I truly enjoyed it. And let's catch up again in the next few months and see where each other's at. That sounds great. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, you bet. And if you guys aren't following Britt, please do so. Click that follow button. And so you know uh, what she's um, giving to the world here on TikTok and on Instagram. So let's talk soon. All right. Sounds great. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. I appreciate your questions. I appreciate your contribution to the conversation. And this is Dave in Denver wishing you health and happiness wherever you're at in the world. I'll talk to you soon.